take it away. So if, if you came here under BizDev or mobile versus PC premises, I'm, I'm sorry, you've been misled. You can just leave. Um, I'm also kind of, I have to apologize that I'm going to be relying on my notes quite a bit for the presentation. Like usually when I talk about marketing or business, facts don't really matter. But now, this is tech. It's important. Um, is this a clicker? Or? And I press the green button to proceed. All right. So uh, the topic is a scalable content pipeline. And I, I think this applies fairly well across mobile to PC and, and other platforms as well. It's also saying with optional open subdivs, and I'll get that to that in, in a second. So, um, and yes, my name is Yannick Ahrama. I'm the CEO of Secret Exit. We're a small indie studio between five and seven people um, located here in Helsinki. But today I am, of course, speaking with the tools lead hat on my head. Anything to stop me from being the CEO. So what the hell are we doing and, and why are we doing it? Um, the problem with us right now is, is that, well, not with us, but with Unity, of course, is, is that uh, there's a standard pipeline, uh, a standard way of doing assets, and a standard way of doing games. And if that standard way doesn't really uh, rub you the right way, then you're kind of stuck um, in making up throwaway single-use solutions. Like, the, the standard shader is there. And the standard shader wants the standard texture map, specular map, normal map, occlusion map, and so forth. And to get those texture maps, then you're obviously using some kind of sculpting tool, so let's say ZBrush, to sculpt your models. Then you re-topo your models, then you bring those in, and you use your texture maps on those to get the final look. But what if you don't want to do that? Like, I mean, we don't have sculpting skills, and I'm not sure if the sculpting workflow is really a good match for small studios. Uh, almost human would definitely disagree, but I feel proud to disagree with them. Um, the, um, we see that there could be a niche for a kind of a new pipeline for doing things, kind of a lo-fi but expressive and scalable way. And this is what I'm going to talk about. It has its own limitations, but also its own advantages. It's not a like a silver bullet solution to a single big problem, but it's more of a way of doing things that avoids friction points <coughs> in, in the standard asset pipeline. So our inspirations are obvious from this image, for example. Here's uh, the works of Mobius and Mezieres, um, 70s French science fiction comics. And what, what I find so absolutely gobsmackingly beautiful about them is their bold use of color. I mean, in, in Unity, you have your standard procedural sky. And even if in Unity it's good to have a blue sky, it's still kind of boring compared to what we have in these images. As far as games, um, Monument Valley was, is a wonderful example of a bold use of palettes. Uh, Firewatch is, I mean, they decided to do their sky with more uh, emphasis on artistic control versus physical realism. Uh, Super Mario World and, and um, Speedball 2 in the corner are kind of proof of that when you were limited by hardware and you had to be more careful with your colors, it was actually a benefit, not a drawback. Uh, Another World is, is a wonderful example, again, of kind of low fidelity but still very expressive art. Journey, well, I've, there are no superlatives that I can use that would uh, be good enough for that game. Mirror's Edge. A wonderful example of how you use palettes to drive your, to color code your world and, and to drive the player. And of course, Inside, which again is a really, really wonderful statement in kind of low fidelity detail, but then high quality lighting. And of course, when it comes to movies, any movie by Wes Anderson is, is a celebration of colors and palettes. So. Forget about sculpting, forget about normal maps, forget about high detail texturing, possibly forget about texture mapping altogether. The sculpt retopo workflow generates these kind of mid-poly meshes that 
while feasible to skin and, te and texture and rig and all that, they're still kind of a pain. And if you can avoid working with too many polygons, then all the better. And for surface detail, maybe again skip texture mapping and, and see what you can do with vertex colors. And here's one example of, of what open subdivs can do with vertex coloring. So on the, on the left, we have our, our mesh, and it's, it's 1,000 faces all together for the head. And actually, over half of those 1,000 faces are used by the teeth. So the, the head itself is roughly maybe, I mean, the face area is maybe 300 polygons all together. But when you push it through the open subdiv, uh, smoothing, creasing, tessellation pipeline, what you end up is a much more high quality model, but this is the rendered model, this is not detail that you have to interact with directly as, a, as an artist. Uh, so this pipeline kind of, uh, if I can give an allegory, it's more like Illustrator versus Photoshop. So Illustrator gives you vector graphics, and vector graphics give you more of a control and thinking over palettes, and they scale to any resolution, obviously. And, and so the, the allegory is very valid here. The, um, as far as polygonal detail, you can subdivide to any hardware, any detail level you want. So kind of edge smoothness and, and the uh, perceived quality of the geometry is no longer an issue. Also, when it comes to performance, when you build a pipeline where everything is vertex shaded and, opens and uses open subdivs, you're actually putting all your assets through a single material, which means that in Unity terms, it's a performance benefit because everything can be batched and there's no, there are no extra draw calls due to material changes and so, <coughs> material changes and so forth. Um, also, for VR, if you're inclined that way, it's, it's a good match. I mean, we hardly need to use high quality and high detail textures uh, in VR environments. So open subdivs, in my opinion, they are the future. Pixar open sourced uh, the technology that they've used in, in pretty much all their movies in 2012. The current situation is that most 3D content creation packages have support for the technology. <laughs> And don't confuse open subdivs and what you can do with them to this kind of DX11 displacement and tessellation shaders that are present in Unity. Like those I, I consider to be a final visual upgrade step. Open subdivs are something that you can apply through your content creation pipeline. So you create low poly meshes and, and get all the way to even displaced materials if you want. Um, also, creasing makes all the difference. So this is an example of an open subdiv control cage. So when our, our high quality artists create their assets, like this is the detail level for the control cage. So like if you've ever modeled a low poly object, I mean, this is familiar to you. The, the thicker blue edges are the ones that my viewport marks as uh, creases. And a crease in, for open subdivs is simply a, a polygon edge. <laughs> Which, is, which has a value that, that uh, describes how hard or smooth that edge is when it's subdivided. So here we have the control cages, and once you plop it through the open subdivision uh, library, the high, quality, high poly mesh that you get back is not this general, like usually when you smooth a poly, unless you use support loops, it just becomes a shapeless blob. But with open subdivs increasing, you're able to avoid that. And also, because of creasing, uh, and I'm speaking to the artists here, you don't need double or triple edge loops to define the, the edges. The single crease value <coughs> in the um, control cage edge or vertex is good enough. So, uh, and also, as a tip, like if you start doing this and you start using creases, predefine your crease categories. Like, use maybe five different values altogether, because that, gi that gives you the control later on to change the values. And, and it, it, instead of having like hundreds of different edges, all with unique ones. It's a tip you'll, you'll see when you try. Um, so I said they're the future, but they're not quite that today. 
We're still waiting for proper game engine implementations. Um, so there's, well, I, I can't comment on what, <laughs> what Unity is doing because they haven't commented on open subdivs, but at least Unreal announced last GDC that open subdivs are supported by the engine. But the way that open subdiv support uh, can be implemented, uh, there are different sta kind of stages for the implementation. So again, game engines don't have direct support. That doesn't mean we can do this ourselves. So here's the current state of using our open subdivs with Unity. So we have our Maya. Well, we use Maya. You can use whatever 3D content creation tool you want. We get our control cage with creases. We bring that over to Unity. Unity has open subdiv library where you plop the uh, low poly control cage to, and the library gives you back a high detail mesh. And then that high detail mesh is sent through uh, to rendering just like any other polygonal object in Unity. The um, Shangri-La version of this that we're waiting for is that the control cage comes from your asset pipeline, goes to the game engine, and from the game engine, it goes all the way to the GPU that handles everything from creasing to tessellation and so forth. And that's, when that happens, it's beautiful. Right now, it's usable, but sadly, still lacking uh, in some of the benefits. <clears throat> Once uh, this happens, content scaling is trivial. I mean, your engine basically handles, well, I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but once everything happens on the GPU, then how much that GPU tessellates is rather trivial to uh, adjust per platform. Right now, with the open subdiv library in Unity, you still have to kind of manage that part on your own. Also, uh, when you were talking about facial animation and, and blend shapes and skinning, once everything's on GPU, we're talking about a beautiful thing because you have your 300 vertex low poly face and you want to make blend shape facial expressions, then instead of the AAA studio style where you have to use a brush tool to paint your influence area and then move that to move the edge of the face or the, the side of your mouth, with open subdivs and facial animation, you can basically just grab a single vertex at the side of the mouth and subdivision gives you the surrounding deformation and the fall off automatically. It's beautiful. So, vertex colors. Really? <coughs> really? Hell yes. Um, we're all kind of predisposed against using vertex colors because, well, I mean, I'm projecting, of course, but vertex colors are usually used in situations where we're going after a really retro, flat-shaded style. And there's not really an example of vertex colors being used together with a physically-based rendering pipeline. And that's a shame, because they work just fine. Like, if you use vertex color layers in your object, that's vertex color occlusion, vertex color, specular, vertex color transmission, and then the albedo layers. And I mean, that's good enough for me. If you're, if you're doing AAA detail mapped characters with the pores of their skin visible, then of course, feel free to disagree. And there's nothing stopping you from augmenting the result, the, the result with a detail texture map, if, if you so wish. So we're, we're doing vertex colors with full multi-channel detail, and, and we're happy with the results. And the, finally, when you go vertex colors all the way, you get palette control. Awesome, awesome palette control. So, like I said, palettes were awesome back in the 16-bit days, back in the 8-bit days, when, when they forced developers to be careful with their color choices. And the same thing is kind of coming back here, and you get, in my opinion, nice benefits. So, kind of to recap, you have your control cage, you subdivide it, you apply vertex colors to the selected vertices and faces, and this is where things start getting kind of interesting. 
I mean, we have in our top, uh, like on the right, it's our um, custom Maya tool, which m makes vertex coloring more easy to, to deal with. I mean, Maya has color sets, but what we're doing is presenting color sets as a layer set, like a Photoshop layer stack to the artist. And over here, you have the section called Apply Master Palette. And when you map your certain <coughs> vertex color layers to certain master palette colors, now all the hard work starts coming together. Now, if only there was a website that gave you a, a resource, a treasure trove of five color palettes. Or, or even better, like going back to the beginning. And then you use the eyedropper tool to slap five different five color palettes across your entire asset pipeline and you're able to prototype different visuals in your scene far beyond the kind of control that you would use with, let's say, tone mapping. And this is what I find interesting. Like, okay, these are still Maya viewport thing, uh, things, so add on top of this the usual post stack of screen space, ambient occlusion, reflections, nicer quality lighting, and so forth. And, and I think that the quality is good enough for a lot of uses for a small studio making unique and colorful games. The tool that I pointed out, that Maya tool is, I mean, we're planning to open source it. Uh, it's not quite ready at la as far as documentation and so forth goes, but I mean, the more people start doing this kind of weird things, the more we can bug Unity about it, and the better support we can hopefully get from game engines. And that is all I have for today. <laughs>